nice to see you this morning. The conclusion of our conference. I want to kind of share a couple of things here. I want to thank everyone of you for coming to the conference. It's been a real blessing having you here and hearing the speakers and what God has uh, spoken to you. And now what we're, what we're going to do when we leave here to make sure we are, are doing God want, God, what, God, what God wants us to do. You know, that's something that um, Rick Irons just passed away on Sunday. That's another one. So we had all these old guys dying. So you young guys got to pick it up, you know. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to carry you too. But no, really, I mean, look what's going on in the world. Whenever I go to a conference, it doesn't matter whether it's big or small, I want to be able to hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. And that's for all of us here. You know, we are privileged to, to, to look. When I look at you guys coming here, to me it's a privilege to have you here. To see what God has done in your lives, what he's doing in your life, fully and completely. And then the speakers that came and spoke to us, I thank God for them. What God is doing in their ministries, what God is doing in their own personal life. That uh, when we leave here, I want God to work in my personal life. Always. You know, you, you kind of, the calling of God. When I got called by God, I, you know, I didn't hear the voice of God. But there was something that I knew that I had to do. I went to Pastor Chuck and I said, Chuck, I don't know what, I'm, what I have to do. I said, I'm in the martial arts. I'm doing my studio and all these things. I'm at Bible studies in my school. And so what do I do? And he says, you know, do what God called you to do. I said, what is that? You know? And then I went home and prayed. And I began to read about Jeremiah, about Paul the apostle, really related to him. And so I went ahead. I told my wife, I said, you know, Sharon, I want to be in the ministry. But then I thought, if I'm in the ministry, God will take away my martial arts. And I don't want it to happen. I'd rather do my martial arts than do God's will. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He says, if you go, I'll, I'll give it to you. And he gave it to me. And wherever I go, I put on demonstrations and share my testimony, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then six, six, uh, six years ago, I took uh, Samurai Fighting, Kempo. So when you take Kempo, a, a Kendo, you have a, a bamboo sword, you know, and then you have a real sword. And what happens is uh, you, when you fight, you know, your instructor, you fight somebody else, you have the mask, you have the whole thing, breastplate, the whole thing. So you get hit three strikes. You hit one, two, and three, you cut. So I'm fighting my instructor for six years, right? Because I want to learn really good. And so we're fighting all of a sudden. I go, stop, stop. And I have this, this seizure. Like, oh, my gosh, man, I can't believe it. So I thought, you know what? Get hit in the head, then in Vietnam I got blown up, so I thought, went to the VA, they said, well, you have a thing in your brain. It could have been when you were in Vietnam, you know, the whole situation. Then I went to UCLA and said, well, you know, we can't really write that up now. He says, but we want to, I want you, he says, we want you to come and spend five days with us so we can do a research or we can do a thing in your brain to see if you need surgery. I said, you know what, I'm not going to have surgery. So I went home. And Pastor Dale and myself, I was uh, on a Wednesday night here. And I got off, you know, and went home in my car, got to my house, and all of a sudden, man, all of a sudden, darkness. Big time. I'm back in Vietnam, and I'm running for my life. I get on the phone, Sharon, get up here right now. Man. I'm going, they're going to try to kill me right now. Get up here. She gets up to my house, and I got everything dark, you know. I'm real paranoid. Never had them in my life, paranoid. Well, we go to the doctor, and I have another one of those men. And I mean, I am, I didn't think I could preach again. I called Chuck, Chuck, uh, somebody's going to have to take the church. I can't do it anymore. I have all these problems. And he prays with me. And I'm out of the pulpit about, I think, four or six, four or six weeks where I can't do anything. I'm just, I'm, I've never been depressed in my life. I wasn't depressed, but I was fearful that somebody was going to kill me. And the enemy came along and began to use that in my life. So now it's been 15, 16 years now that I have seizures. And that is embarrassing to me. I'll be teaching somewhere and all of a sudden from my navel to my brain, 
I can't speak, I can't read, so I have to stand still. And I have to get off the pulpit. Because if I don't, I start mumbling. You know, and it's embarrassing. Man, I almost died when I did that. I learned to keep quiet. I learned to go back and kind of kick back. And something says five minutes, something says 10 minutes. And some I can't come back out. So you know, I stand in the back, then I go home and rest. And it's something like Paul the Apostle said, Lord, when are you going to help me? Lord, I'm teaching, I'm preaching, I'm in your ministry. What are you going to do with my life? Three times I Paul, and then I said, Lord, no more. Whatever you want in my life, I will do. And I heard this voice, it says, you don't like your cross? Hmm. My cross? It's your cross. No, no, it's your cross. And so I began to study the cross. And let me read you before I get into my sermon. He said, John Wesley, give me a hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God. And we will shake the gates of hell and bring the kingdom in our generation to the Lord. I love that. Just a hundred men. I mean, think about it. It's so awesome to see you, young guys, old guys here. We're all together. And think of what you can do in your life and in other people's lives where God has called you. God has called you here. It's not how you speak. It's how you worship. It's how you worship the Lord in your private life, waiting for the message. I tell the body here all the time, you know, I can't get up here and just speak. God has to speak to me so he can speak through me to the body of Christ. Otherwise, I have no message. I shouldn't really teach. And I had to learn how to teach. I was just an evangelist, you know, like Mike and Greg, we were evangelists. And I went one time to check because when I had my school, when I had my school there in West Covina, and I had my Bible studies, you know, in that studio, probably said about 100 people. That a person that came to help me and another person, they came to me one day and said, you know what, you really are not a pastor. Why don't you go and go preach? And what they wanted to do is take over the church. So I went to check and checks and say, boot them out. <laughs> okay, boot them out, <laughs> you know? So I boot them out and then God began to speak to me and says, I want to teach you. I'm going to teach you. I said, Lord, I don't even know how to speak, Lord. He said, I want to teach you. And I thought, wow, Lord. Teach me. I want to learn about you. I want to teach about you. I want to be like you. Be you imitators. Know you not that you're the, what, the temple of the living God, and if any man defile the temple of God, God himself shall destroy him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The power of the cross the power of the cross. You know, when I speak about the cross always, you know, because to me it was a real effect in my life and continues to do that. I can remember when I read about Jesus being born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. And then Mary and Joseph, they went back to Nazareth for 30 years and he grew up there as a carpenter. And I don't know if Joseph was alive, but Mary was alive. And at the age of 30, he had a call. And that call was to do what? To go out, preach, teach, and heal. Threefold ministry. And he did that. He chose 12 men, one a traitor. And to me, it's interesting that he kept the traitor, the one that was stealing, the one that was not only in himself trying to be not only a person that was always taking, forget everybody else, but about me, hey, I got the money. And then... As he chooses these 12 guys, but the 11 are the ones that are going to be disciples. So they go through, they preach for three years, you know, they're coming to an end of the ministry. You know, Peter's story, I'm not going to repeat it. And the Lord was there, arrested, stood before the Romans, he got beat, you know, in 39 stripes. And, you know, when you looked at Jesus without, God, actually, the stripes in his back, real stripes that he had. And then when they placed that crown of thrones in his head, the Palestinian throne. And then when they put that crown of thrones, they gave him a cross. 
And when that cross was given to him, he didn't complain. Father, remember the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, whatever, whatever you want me to do, I want your will for my life. If you want me to die, I will die. Obedience. I told the Lord when I went to him, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I want to do whatever you want me to do. Whatever. I'll go anywhere. God had given me a radio ministry with Greg and Chuck. You know, we were on different stations. And what we used to do is we used to go out to New York, Chicago, all these places. Sometimes together, sometimes separate. But the Lord began to show me personally as I would go out and do my radio rallies. I went to Kentucky. I remember, I have an accent. Okay, they're all white. Okay. <laughs> I go there and I told you, I don't know about this. You know, there's no Mexican Germans here in Spaniards, you know. And we get to the, we get to the auditorium and there's 4,000 people waiting, all white. And I walk in, I give my sermon and all these people come, you know, they stand in line and I stay there and talk to them, shake hands. I go to New York and we're in New York City and, you know, Puerto Ricans there and every kind of uh, nationality. So they tell me, okay, why don't we do this before you teach? Let's choose three Puerto Ricans with accents and let them go on stage and say, which one's Raul Reese? <laughs> so, oh man, <laughs> with an accent, right? So they choose three guys and they go up on stage and they go, okay, which one's Raul Reese? Uh, can you speak a little? And, you know, and they give an accent, the next one accent, the next one accent. He said, well, none of them are Raul Reese. So I said, here's Raul Reese. I get up there, and they look at me, and they go, Raul Reese. I said, hear my accent? I'm Raul Reese. And my accent has been, to me, it's been a thorn in the flesh. Because my family doesn't have an accent. I have an accent. At the age of 10, I came from Mexico City here. And uh, I was here from 10 all the way to the present time, and I never got rid of my accent. And one day the Lord spoke to me. He said, who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? Who made your heart? I said, Lord, I'll never complain ever again. In the cross of Jesus Christ, when I saw the cross, I said, Lord, thank you for the cross in my life. They took Jesus, they put him up, they nailed him, Imagine, nail those spikes through his hands, through his feet. And then to raise him up and drop him into this hole, that when they drop him, he's not only his shoulders, but his armpits, they rip. You can't even identify him. And he's there, his mother's there, the other women are there, the disciples, you know, the, the whole case of Peter, he denies him three times. And when the Lord looks up, he says, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, Father, because they don't really know what they're doing. And here we are. You know, a lot of times I, I think about my own personal life and what God has done and what I have done against him in my own personal life. Not as a non-believer, as a Christian. You know, we do things we shouldn't be doing. You know, with my wife, I mistreated my wife. And when you do something like that, you know, you have to live with it, to live with it. My wife passed away last a month ago. I was here at Calvary getting ready to preach, and Ryan called me and says, hey, mom is going. So I got in the car, and I, they took me to my house, and I got there five minutes after she passed away. But I am so happy that Ryan was there, that Ryan was there. Because she prayed for Ryan for years and years and years. And to see his mom, and for him to be with his mom as she went to heaven was the most amazing thing in my life. And I asked the Lord, Lord, forgive me. Because I know God was behind her when, before I came to Christ. And you know, you guys in the ministry, we have pressures and we get up tight, we do things like that. And, and maybe you're here because maybe you're a wife and you're suffering from something. Maybe your husband's mistreating you. Maybe, you know, he has a girlfriend or maybe you have a boyfriend or maybe you really don't want to be in the ministry. 
My wife had a call for missions, but before I got saved, she packed up and she was leaving. And when I got saved, I said, sure, pack your bags, but go the other way now. Go to Colombia and see what you have to do. And if you see the movie or the document later, you'll see the whole story. And so in the last days, three days before she passed away, I'm thinking of the cross. Lord, the cross, the cross, the cross. I wake up, I'm sleeping on the floor, and I wake up, and she's sitting on the bed, on the edge of the bed. She can't walk. And she's sitting there. And I said, are you okay, Sharon? She says, I have to go to the restroom. I pick her up, and I carry her. I don't want to cry. I carried her. And then I had to pick her up again and bring her back and put her in bed. I'll never forget that in my life. You know why? Because she was my wife in Vietnam. I picked up too many people, little pieces. But it wasn't like my wife. 56 years, July the 6th this year, married. The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God. So when I think of Paul the Apostle here in 1 Corinthians, we heard the other day the carnal Christians. And then we hear about Revelations chapter, you know, chapter 3, the last, the last church, La Lucia. You're either cold, you're hot, or, you know, what happens? You're lukewarm. And if you're lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. Spew you out of my mouth. You guys, you can be a flake. You can't be cold, you can't be lukewarm. We gotta be hot for the Lord. Like never before. Young guys, you gotta be hot for the Lord. There are too many distractions today, but if you look at the cross of Jesus Christ, there's really no distraction because if you're looking at the cross, the Lord is speaking to you. You're dying to yourself. And Paul here in Corinthians, in chapter 1, verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The power of God. The cross it's not a popular message, for sure, today. But the cross is not, you know, the cross is not being preached, not being preached by a lot of pastors. You hear a lot of messages on the radio, you know, you hear a lot of pastors preaching, and there's these churches that are, they don't want to lose people, so they preach something else to bring contentment. To say, stay in my church, you know, I need your finances. So I'm not going to preach the cross. I'm not going to preach a message that convicts people. So you have a carnal church. And then you don't have a carnal church, then you have no church. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not being preached. The cross, the cross, the instrument of death. The instrument of death to each one of us individually. You know, we are here to be changed. And to leave this place different when we came to this conference. We need to leave dead, alive in Christ. We need to be reckoned the old man to be dead. And to come to that place, say, you know what, Lord, I'm sick of my life. I've been in ministry all these years, so I've just started ministry, you know, and, and you're, you're actually, God, what, what should I do? How do I do it? And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I've never asked for money, ever, ever, ever in my life. I believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. I believe that Christ not only called me, but he allowed me to be a pastor, to be an evangelist, and to have this place that you see where I paid $145,000 a month without having it. And every month God would meet the need through prayer, through prayer. They came a couple of uh, years ago, a couple of a Jewish company that we know. And they say, you know, Raul, we want to buy your property. I said, well, what property? He says, that property that you see over there is, is taxable. And I said, well, how much you want to give me? 
He said, well, we want to give you, you know, not 50, 15 million dollars, I was 60 million. I said, hey, what else? He said, I'm going to build you a road up there. I'm going to give you half of the water here. I'm going to give you a new, a new payment, a new outside. Everything will be brand new. And the next day, I got a check for a million dollars. And then he sent me $15 million. I went to the bank, and I paid it off. And I was zero. Because I'm old. I don't, I, don't, I don't want people to be burdened, whoever takes over the church here. I, I want to make sure that they think I'm not about money, but I'm about Christ and the cross to preach, to teach. If God's in it, how can we fail? How can we fail? When the cross of Jesus Christ teaches me to die to self, in Matthew 16, 24, he says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So denial, cross, and follow me. Three things. How are we doing that? The cross of Jesus Christ, denying myself before the Lord. Forget about yourself. Think about him. Let him use your life. Allow him to do great things that you can't do apart from him. Apart from him. We don't take offerings. And every Sunday, we barely make it, but we make it. I love that. Because I want to believe by faith that God called me. That I'm here because God called me, and I hope you're here because God called you. That when you leave here, when you came through those doors... You leave crucified your life. When you go back, people can see the change. Your congregation, your family. That God has really spoken to you. And I just came to sit, you know, fellowship with other people. But you came here, you know, to not only be ministered to, but to minister to others. To minister to others. But most important, you came here so that God can change your life change your life, to give you more power. Lord, empower me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, when you send me to South America, Mexico, all these places that I have to go, because we have Calvary's chapels. And when I go there, I see these guys, they listen to Chuck's tapes. Nobody can work here unless you go through all of Chuck's tapes, which now you don't have tapes. You got to know Chuck's philosophy. You have to know Chuck's doctrine. I don't want to listen to me. Listen to Chuck. He's an amazing teacher. And then we're of same mind, same philosophy, same doctrine, and you don't have divisions. And if you have divisions, then you can say, you're not welcome here. You have to leave. Because the cross of Jesus Christ is to die to self and not to try to take over ministries or do anything against any brother or sister. Dying to self. The cross was used as an instrument of death. It was either a plain vertical stake to which the victim was fa fastened with the hands tight or nailed above the head or such a stake provided with a crossbar to which the victim was fastened with the arms stretched out. This form of punishment was used among the Egyptians in Genesis 40:19. The Corinthian or Carginians and, per and Persians, Esther 710, the Assyrians, the, the Scythians, the Indians, the Germans, and for earlier times among the Greeks and the Romans, after the conquest of Tyra, Alexander the Great ordered 2,000 Tyrians to be crucified as punishment for the resistance of which that city was made. Crucifixion was abolished by, the, by Constantine, probably toward the end of his reign, owing doubleness to, the increasing, to his increasing reverence for the cross. Punishment by the cross was confined to slaves or malefactors of the worst class, exception for it was a privilege of Roman citizenship. Roman citizenship. When you begin to speak on the cross, people get very uncomfortable. 
and offended. You know, I don't understand when, you know, when I, I used to go to the Catholic Church, and I was a Catholic by name. But I, I, I was talking to some Catholics the other day. I said, well, why is it that when you go into the Catholic Church, Jesus is still on the cross? Why is Mary a priority and not Jesus? Why don't they take him off? He's not there any longer. And the people, they're not worshiping Jesus on their dashboards. They have Mary. And then Mexico has the water of Guadalupe. All these, all these saints, all these idols, when the Bible speaks against the idols. But we worship Jesus. God is a spirit, and those that worship and notice Jesus, we worship him in spirit and in truth. And in truth. The cross demands death for me, myself, and I. So many people do not understand the significance of the cross. Paul understood the cross in his own personal life. At the end of his life, after serving the Lord for so many years, he said, I got to go to Jerusalem. I got to go to Rome. And they took him and they, they killed him. He became a martyr. It was the it was Charles Spurgeon that said, no matter what text he, choose, he chose, he moved as quickly as possible across the country to the cross of Jesus Christ. To the cross of Jesus Christ. This is a good example for us leaders to follow. The cross of Jesus Christ. Especially the days we're facing today. Pastors drinking, Adultery, fornication, stealing money from the church, not really having holy lives, but still want to be in the ministry. There was a pastor down the street here, Calvary Chapel. His wife had cancer. That, while she was in the church with him and having cancer, he was having sexual intercourse with the women in the church. And then he died, she died. And then he got cancer, and he died. You can't get away with sin. You cannot get away with sin. God gives you the opportunity of being here, like last night we prayed, that when you leave here, leave, leave your sin on the cross. Leave your sin on the cross. So when you go back, you've been resurrected. You're now carrying your cross. And then you, we might see revival in America, in the church. We need revival. You know, in the Jesus People Movement, I fell right into it because there was a revival going on. I just got back from Vietnam, Oakland Neighborhood Hospital. They locked me up. Ashbury was there, so one day we went to Ashbury. And all these hippies, that's where it started, all these hippies. And then I get discharged, and then the next couple of years, my mother says, hey, there's, a, there's actually a place in Costa Mesa that I'm preaching the gospel, and there's all young people, you need to go there. I was 24. I said, oh, I don't think so. I was 22 then, I don't think so. And then I went, and I never came back the same. The Lord changed my life. I got saved in my home by myself, my wife leaving me, never heard the voice of God, never saw miracles or angels. By faith, I stepped out, by faith. Next day, I went and got a Bible. They only had old King James Bibles, you know. I could barely speak English about your old King James. Thee, thou, thee, you know. <laughs> but the Lord helped me through Chuck, you know. And so what happens is I come back and two years later, when I come to know Christ and get a Bible, and the first thing I do, because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of the cross, the Lord sent me back to my old high school, Bassett High School, Glendora High School, Azusa High School, Northview High School, Baum Park High School. When I go there, I don't know how to speak. I just started, I just became a Christian. I walk into Baum Park High School, that's where I went to school years later. Uh, years before, and I, Mr. Barnhol, I used to play baseball. Mr. Barnhol in Hollowbeck, where 
principal and vice principal. So I go into the office. I say, hey, can I come into the campus and give them the cross of Jesus Christ? <laughs> they called the police and got me out of the high school. I mean, I went home. I was so bummed out. Lord, I, I got saved. I got the Bible. I want to tell people about you. Man, two weeks. The Lord speaks to my heart. Go back. I go back. And they say, Raul, you're welcome to come to the classrooms, to the outside, whatever you want to do, you can do in campus. And that happened in every school. I used to go to Baum Park, sit on the actual, you know, the tables at lunchtime, and all I'm sitting there looking at the kids and incoming cake, incoming milk. I go, Lord, let me kill one and then there will be nothing. <laughs> it will stop, for sure. <laughs> and the Lord has teach me to be patient. And you know what, from that point on, the cross became more real in my life. I love the cross, I love preaching on the cross. That's what's kept me for 50 some years, the cross of Christ, and it will keep you. So we want revival, we have to crucify our flesh. Charles Spurgeon said to his ministerial students, more and more, he says, am I jealous less any views upon prophecy, church government, politics, or even systematic theology. She would draw one of us from, the, from glorifying in the cross of Christ. Salvation is a theme for which I would enlist every holy tongue. Every holy tongue. Can you believe that? We have holy tongues. We have a holy life. The outside, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be gone. Going back into the earth worms. But right now we are what? The tent. A tent of the Lord. He lives within us. And when you came to Christ, yeah, you start getting old. You start getting wrinkled. You know, it used to be muscle one now. You're, actually, your chest is down here now, you know. And you, you look in the mirror, man, what happened? You know? But the inward, I look at myself and go, God, Lord, this is not me. Lord, hurry up and take me with my new body, with my new life, my wife. You know, people ask me, are you still sad about it? No, I'm not. She's in heaven. I got to go the next step. I love my wife, but I can't feel sorry for myself for a year or two years. You got to go forward. You got to go forward. And you got to preach and you got to teach and you got to love people. And you got to go to the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. Johannes Schroeder said, It has been the cross which has revealed the, which has revealed to good men that their goodness has not been good enough. We think we're good, and we're not. I don't know where you are today, this whole week, whatever got spoken to you. But if you go back the same way you came here, you're going to be one miserable person. You go back to drinking. You go back to abuse your wife. You go back to smoking marijuana. One of the pastors back in the Midwest was smoking marijuana during the week, drinking on Friday nights, preaching on Sunday morning. The people were there, but he didn't, he didn't realize that he wasn't there. The Holy Spirit was no longer there. You can have the crowds, but it's the Holy Spirit there. That's what I saw in Calvary Chapel, and that's what I see in Calvary Chapel today. You guys, you guys, we want another revival. You're that generation, you young guys. You got to do it. And I tell some of the young guys, you know, if you're 18, 19, you're 25, 30, you know, I'm, I'm 77 this year. And I say, you know, you got a long time to go. Are you going to make it? All these temptations, all these things that are before us, are you going to make it? The devil hates you. He hates the cross. He hates the cross. And he will continue to hate you because you love Jesus. And because... You've given up many things to serve him. And he wants not only to use your life, but he wants to have other people see your life and they can come to know Christ, your family, your friends. 
You know, I shared with the church the other day, you know, we're Christians, you know, we have the Lord, we're pastors, we're doing all these things. And then I asked the people, you know, you're, you're trying to witness to your family or friends, and then they see you drinking. I walked into a restaurant with Pastor Dale, and the people that come here, a family, they were drinking. And they saw me, and, you know, they hit their drink. And I said, you know, hey, we're not, you don't have to hide your drink with us. What is the Holy Spirit telling you to do? The Holy Spirit is the one that does that. So if you're drinking, fornicating, committing adultery, and you're smoking marijuana, and you're doing all these things, and you're lying, liars will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul. Well, Peter, uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, chapter 6, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5, and you go through the scriptures speaking to Christians. Not non-believers, Christians. Paul wrote those, very, uh, those epistles for who? For us. And he warns us. I call it 14 letters. Even he was, I think it, Paul wrote it. 14 letters. And I thank God for you. I thank God for you. That you're here. And Paul said, I am, I am crucified with Christ. Galatians 5.20. In my tombstone, I'm going to put, you know, Philippians 121. For me to live is Christ and to die is to gain. That's it. For me to live is Christ, but to die is to gain. I have obeyed the word of God, and now I'm ready to meet the Lord. Ready to meet the Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 6, knowing this, that our all men was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. From sin. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God which is a reasonable service, and don't be conformed to this world. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of who? God. The will of God. Preaching the cross is much more than preaching about the cross. I like that. Preaching the cross is much more than preaching about the cross. It means... Seeing God's truth through the cross and the grace of God in my life. The grace of God in my life. That he loves me. That he's called me. That I can love you. You can love me. And we can fight the fight. We're an army. You know, we're warriors. Warriors for Christ. I was a warrior in Vietnam. I went through a lot. That taking the hill, I had to go back to Vietnam and film it. And the way it happened, I was with Billy Graham, and they wrote an article, you know, about me, and I said things that I should have never said. So the government got a hold of me. They were going to take me in. And then they asked three guys they found in my platoon that I hadn't seen in 40-some years. One of them, his mom, listened to me on the radio in New York. They didn't know it was me. They knew his son. So they called me. And we find these guys because they found them first and they asked them if this is true. Separate them. Then they called me and they separated me. And every story was the truth. The truth. Excuse me. And then the Lord spoke to me. My wife went with me to Vietnam. It was probably one of the hardest things for me to go back to Vietnam, to film, to go to those places. That I had been, and tell my wife see what happened, and then sit on China Beach, there looking out, and asking the Lord to forgive. To forgive me, to cleanse me, wash me, because of the dreams that I've had. 
And then I read about the cross of Jesus Christ again. For the Christ says, For Christ did not send me to be baptized, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Jesus Christ should be made of no effect. No effect. Some Christian missionaries, you probably heard this before, once visited Muhammad Gandhi. And he asked them to sing to, sing to him one of their hymns. He said, which one do you ask? And then he replies, he says, sing for me one that best expresses what you are preaching. It took them but a moment to decide together, they sang, when I, shoot, when I survey the wondrous cross. The wondrous cross. I love the cross. I love my Savior. The cross of Christ is a must to everyone. As we saw in 1 Corinthians 1.17, the cross reconciles Ephesians 2.16 in that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. The cross of Christ makes enemies. Philippians 3.18, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now I tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross of Christ brings peace. Colossians 1.20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. The cross of Christ crucifies the world. Galatians 6, 14. But God forbids that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I in the world. I in the world. The cross of Christ saves me from wrath of God. Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, he shall be saved from wrath through him. And the cross of Christ has redeemed me. 1 Peter 1.18 Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct or received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, the cross of Jesus Christ demonstrates his love for us. Listen carefully. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first one from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Charles Spurgeon said, there are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers here below. There are no crown wearers in heaven who were not cross bearers here below. A.W. Tozer says the old cross slew men. The new cross entertains them. The old cross condemns. The new cross amuses. The old cross destroys confidence in the flesh. The new Christ incur no, the new cross in carry encourages every single one of us. The cross of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Lord, thank you so much for these wonderful people, Lord. Lord, help us not to follow men, not to follow any organization, Lord God, any denomination. Lord, help us to follow you. And Lord, as we follow you, Jesus, help us to learn to be prayer warriors, to be warriors, Lord. And as we become warriors, our children will become warriors as they see what we do. Our friends, our enemies. And Lord, because I love these people, Lord, I pray for them. Oh, I pray for them. Lord, help us not to leave here the same, but different. And thank you so much for all these guys that preach and taught the word of God. 
And Lord, help us to be uniters, not dividers. Chuck never taught us division. He taught us to love, to care, not to worry about other churches or other denominations, but to follow doctrine, to have confidence in you, Lord, and to be what you have called us to be. And I thank you so much for Calvary Chapel, Lord. For Chuck teaching me the word of God and Kay loving us. And my wife with Kay. That board that he chose years ago, Lord. And we thank God for that board. And we thank these people today, my brothers and sisters, Lord. That you would touch them. That you would anoint them, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said,